up into the confusion Can't you hear the sound that's in the air? And now for something completely different. Ah! Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning welcome to the show. Of course, it's the second best day of the week. Uh, it's Thursday. About to wrap it up. Also, it's the last day of the month. Uh, September the 1st, right around the corner, that would be tomorrow. So uh, again, you know, this is uh, interesting because now we're moving into September, which typically, and we'll talk some about that this morning, you know, typically tends to be one of the worst performing months of the year, but there's some exceptions to that. And uh, part of that is, you know, what has happened previous to going to the month of September. However, before we get to that, and like I said, we'll, we'll touch on that here in just a minute. Uh, a few other things. Yesterday's ADP report came out weaker than expected. Also a downward revision to GDP. So there's a very interesting dichotomy that's going on right now between economic data as we see it coming in. And again, GDP has been a lot stronger than a lot of people have thought it should have been by now, right? I mean, so, you know, we talk about the inverted yield curves. We talk about the leading economic indicators all suggesting an economic slowdown. Um, but yet, economic data has been fairly robust this year. Um, first quarter growing, second quarter, you know, we're now at 2.1% <clears throat> GDP growth. Uh, estimates, I haven't seen the latest Atlanta Fed GDP now, but uh, as of the other day, Atlanta Fed GDP now had GDP tracking for the third quarter at over 5% growth. So, I mean, fairly, and now these are annualized rates, by the way, but um, fairly strong economic data. The issue, though, is, is there is a gap now between GDP, which is the gross domestic product, that's what we measure, that's, and, and how do we calculate GDP, in case, just in case you happen to want to know. It's, uh, <laughs> it's personal consumption expenditures that makes up about you know, a big chunk of, of the GDP report. Uh, it's in net exports, right? So it's imports less exports. Uh, government spending, business investment, right? So that's what makes up the GDP report. There's also another calculation that we don't talk about, which is GDI. That is the gross domestic income, right? And so this is the income that's being generated by the economy. So now think about this. If your gross domestic product is growing at 5%, pick a number, what should your income be growing at? Now, logic should tell you that that should be a very close correlation because why? Well, income counts because if income is coming in, I have money to spend to do all this other stuff, right? There is now a very, and, and normally there's a very close correlation between GDI and GDP. That's, and that's really kind of a, a you know, kind of, uh, you know, logical and that's what you would expect to see. However, since early last year, there has now become a very big divergence between the gross domestic income, which is declining, and gross domestic product, which is increasing. So this is going to be uh, an interesting kind of dichotomy that ultimately we're going to have to play catch up. Either GDP is going to get revised lower over the next year or so, because we, you know, uh, again, when we report GDP, we edit, we ask, you know, we do three three revisions over the, the quarter. We do a revision a year later, and then three years later, we do the final revisions to all our GDP numbers. So either that GDP number is going to be revised down fairly sharply over the course of the next year or two, or GDP is going to have a really tough time growing from here. In other words, we're going to see much slower rates of economic growth as income catches up ultimately to that. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens here. But again, there's a, this, 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 this deviation between income and product is going to have to rectify itself at some point. You can't keep, keep having these, uh, you know, these extremely strong growth rates in the economy as gross domestic income is falling. It just logically doesn't work out that way. So uh, be something worth paying attention to because again, it, it, this has been this whole issue of you know, this lag effect. And of course, you know, analysts have you know, last year expecting a recession. This year now, nobody expects a recession. Everybody's assuming a soft landing. Vanguard out this morning 
suggesting that you should buy value stocks because value stocks perform best in early economic recoveries. So there you go. So you have now, you know, kind of Wall Street economists, everybody else expecting that we're now have come out of a recession, theoretically, even though we never had one. And now we're back into an economic recovery. But yet all the other economic indicators like leading economic indicators and yield curves, etc. all still suggest that a recession is coming. Who's right? I have no idea. You know, we've talked about, you know, forecast previously. Very interesting chart out this morning by Charter that analyzes the prediction rate of meteorologists going back to 1980 and predictions 10 days out, right? Have And this is, and look, because of all the scientific data that we have now and air pressure measurements and all this, accuracy of predictions has become much better by meteorologists. Uh, three days out, they have a near 90% accuracy of their prediction. 10 days out falls to 50%. So tell me this, if <laughs> meteorologists who have actual data to work with to make a prediction over the next 10 days are only 50% right over a 10-day period, how on earth do economists and analysts expect to be right a year from now? Just, just saying. Just saying. Okay, here's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Markets rallying again yesterday. And look, we've had two strong back-to-back -back days. We've actually had four days in a row now of an advancing market. After correcting 5% uh, in August, we're now about to come, uh, sorry, between the beginning of August and, and the bottom, uh, we corrected about 5%, came down, retested support going back to uh, mid-June of, of, of this year, bounced off that, cleared the 50 and the 20-day moving average over the last couple of days, have triggered a buy signal. Markets not yet back to more extreme overbought conditions. So again, still some leg here left uh, for this potential rally, get us back up to around 4,600 on the S&P. Now, as I was saying earlier, September tends to be historically a weak month. However, if you strip out big down years like, you know, 2007, others, it's not as bad of a down month. But importantly, when August has had a reversal of the gains in July, then basically September tends to be a positive month. Just on average. So again, it's kind of a, again, here we are making predictions. Our, our meteorological prediction for the next 10 days is that the markets may actually kind of try to push up here a little bit. Again, we're not overbought, we're on a buy signal. So the data suggests market momentum still kind of in, in tow here. Um, it's been pretty much though a driver of those big seven stocks, right? It's, it's, it's money is hiding in those big seven stocks, this is actually something we're touching on in this weekend's newsletter, is that this is really maybe more of a function. The reason that there's so much money flowing into these big mega cap companies is because of the interest service coverage that they have. In other words, they there's very little risk of bankruptcy in these big mega cap companies. So for hedge fund managers and mutual funds, et cetera, that need to hide money uh, in a place that's highly liquid and safe, in the stock market because they have to be invested, these big mega cap companies have been the place to go because if you take a look at, for instance, the Russell 2000, that's where the risk of bankruptcy is. And again, a lot of these small and mid cap companies do not have the interest coverage ratios to actually support um, the refinancing that's coming up. And there's a big refinancing wall coming up on term loans starting next year and the year after. There's a big ramp up in those. So again, they're going to have to refinance potentially at higher rates. They don't have the interest coverage ratio to cover that. And as you as, as you know, as opposed to the S&P 500, which has had a very nice advance, small and mid caps have done nothing since October, but that's where the risk is. So money isn't really flowing into these stocks. That's why they continue to underperform. Um, but and money keeps kind of all crowding into these very narrow trades. So again, uh, maybe a little bit of something going on, but you know, as big mega cap companies continue to absorb liquidity because it's easy in, it's easy out. You don't have to worry about it and it's safe. You don't have to worry about bankruptcy risk. That's what you need to know before the bell this morning. When we come back, we'll join Michael Leibowitz to talk a little bit about what the Fed said last week. Some interesting comments. We haven't had a chance to talk about the summit, uh, Jackson Hole Summit speech. And Mike and I will talk a little bit about what uh, Jerome Powell said and didn't say. Coming up next right here on The Real Investment Show. 
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN, or again, simply online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. So welcome back to the show this morning. So a couple of things. Uh, we've had some uh, a good bit of economic data coming out over the last couple of days. And, and, you know, part of the reason behind the rally in the markets of the last couple of days has been the data has come in weaker than analyst estimates. And this has, of course, given hope now to the, the bulls that the Fed is now done cutting rates. And, of course, if they're done cutting rates, that means what, right? Rate cuts are coming fairly soon, right? So monetary accommodation, lower rates, higher stock prices. That's the theory anyway. Um, but again, we have another big set of data coming out this morning. Um, economists surveyed by Wall Street Journal expect the data to show today that consumers have increased their spending over the last month rather significantly. The commerce uh, consumer spending is expected to rise seven-tenths of a percent in July. That's up from the 0.5% in June. Uh, that would be the monthly fastest pace in spending since January. Now, part of that's also going to be, you know, back getting ready for back to school and, and those type of things. So that's that's in there also the July 4th weekend. Um, so, uh, consumer prices, excluding energy and food, rose 4.2 percent in July. This is expectations. That's going to be up from 4.1 in June. And the core index is expected to be up 0.2 percent in July. Uh, versus the same pace uh, the month before. Consumer uh, personal income is also expected to increase three-tenths of a percent in July. And again, this is all under the function or, or this idea that you know consumers remain in good shape because incomes and wages have been rising, you know, employment's still strong. But some of the data has been a little bit disappointing. It's like ADP report yesterday showed some weakness in the job market. Uh, tomorrow, of course, Friday, um, is the big BLS employment number. So between yesterday, today, and tomorrow, lots of economic data out. And of course, this is all going to feed into that narrative of whether or not the Fed is done hiking rates or not. And so uh, let's talk a little bit more about the Fed. And of course, uh, last Friday was the Jackson Hole Summit. And Mike and I haven't had a chance to talk with you yet about his speech and what he said and, and didn't say. So we'll get into some of that this morning. But Mike, uh, before we get into that, you know, this this whole idea is, is kind of interesting because as I was saying in the, the first segment, GDP is is fairly grossly deviated from gross domestic income, which shouldn't be going on. And it suggests that GDP should actually be weaker than than is currently being reported. 
the last couple of days, economic data has been coming in weaker than expected. And and again, you know, the the estimates are still fairly high by economists that the economy is doing just fine here. So it is a bit of a conundrum for the Fed. I mean, if the Fed's worried about inflation, strong spending and strong incomes is certainly not a, a reason to stop hiking interest rates. Right, <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, you were talking about the gap between GDP and uh, GDI. And you made a statement I thought was pretty interesting. You said they're either going to revise GDP lower, you know, a year mm-hmm. from now or so, or GDP is going to catch up to GDP, GDI in the next com- few quarters. Right. So either they're going to find out that we're in a recession now or that we're going to be in a recession later because GDI has been negative now for three quarters. So assuming that's how the catch up and look, the catch up could be GDI gets revised higher mm-hmm. or GDI starts heading higher too but uh it's kind of an interesting conundrum and i just wonder if this has to do with inflation and the fact that you really can't measure inflation so you know any variables in the inflation formulas used in in income in the products that are sold and then the deflators that they use to create gdp and gdi may really just be screwing up that relationship. And it may just be an invalid relationship Mm -hmm. until inflation kind of gets back to 2%. Right. So, you know, it just further clouds our 10-day forecast. (laughs) Which is a coin flip at best, as we said. So Exactly. But but again, this is, uh, you know, it is kind of an interesting conundrum because, you know, the, the, you know, it was interesting and something that, that, you know, you know, if you look at Google searches as of late, there's been a massive spike in the number of people searching the quote unquote neutral rate. All of a sudden, it's become a hot topic, right? Um, and, and it's interesting because, you know, there was a lot of talk going into the Jackson Hole Summit that, well, the Fed's going to have to revise up that neutral rate from 2% to 3% and have a higher inflation target because inflation's now here and it's not going anywhere it's just going to we're going to have a higher uh, you know spate of inflation from now on it's a new it's a new environment that we're in uh, and it was interesting because Jerome Powell basically just ignored all of that conversation and said our target rate's still 2%. Right. Right. I, I thought that was a pretty meaningful event. You know, so, like you said, some of the Fed members want to raise the neutral rate. And what they're really saying is that the natural economic growth rate of this country is higher than than it was. Mm-hmm. They want to raise it. So the neutral rate is essentially the, the right interest rate that is neither too restrictive or too stimulative. It's kind of like the speed limit. It's 55. Right. If you're going too fast, you ultimately end up with more crashes. And if you go too slow, you end up with more problems as well. More Mike, traffic. Uh, but real quick, Mike obviously doesn't live in Texas where the no. speed limit is 70. But other than that. <laughs> um, you can't even go 50. Well, you can't even go 70 on your roads either. I've been there. <laughs> so but, uh, but no, you're right. So, the you know, the neutral rate is kind of that that ideal point of where, you, you know, the, the economy is doing fine. But again, that suggests that if if the if the neutral rate is now three percent, that the growth rate of the economy has to be near three. Right. Right. But more importantly, it's that, look, the the neutral rate is this, there is no real true calculation. It's kind of a made up number. So I think it's just they want to raise it. So for some reason, they think that the natural economic growth rate of this country has increased. Mm -hmm. That's something that hasn't happened in 40 years. Yeah, it's variable. It, It goes up, it goes down. But in 40 years, the trend has been lower. And according to, look, there are a couple of ways to calculate the natural economic growth rate. One is just looking at productivity trends and demographic trends. And there are two Fed calculations, which we put in a commentary, I think it was late last week, which all point to growth of somewhere between 1% and 1.7%, mm-hmm. which is slightly less than it was before the pandemic and on a steadily declining scale. So there's Again, there's nothing that says uh, that that tells me that the economy is on an upward trajectory as far as growth. Doesn't mean we won't be growing, just growing at a lesser rate than we were growing yesterday and lesser than the day before that. So so what's interesting is Powell came out and said, absolutely not. He's you know, he said the neutral rate was like he said, trying to manage Fed policy to the neutral rate was like trying to navigate to the stars in the mm-hmm. dark on a boat, right? <laughs> he basically poo-pooed the whole idea 
and he said, we will, we are getting our inflation, we will get the inflation rate to 2%. And he made no bones about that meaning that that's where the neutral rate was thought to be. That's where they're going to get it to. Right. Uh, but, that, but, that, but that also makes sense because if you look at the Fed's own projections, or every quarter the Fed releases their projections on economic growth and inflation and, mm -hmm. and employment. And if you even take a look at the long-term projections of the Fed, right, right. their long-term projection is less than 2%. I think it's 1.8. It used to be 1.9. They've ratcheted it down to 1.8 now. So you know, even their own forward projections are less than 2%. And, and Mike, you, you made an important point, and I just want to make sure that people understand this, is that the growth rate, if you just average the growth rate, do it like an exponential trend growth of the economy. Pre-2000, the economy was growing at about 3.2% on average, real. This is real, in, real GDP, inflation-adjusted. Right. After the dot-com crisis, that fell to about 2.8% growth. After the financial crisis, we fell to a 2.2% growth. So every time we have these crises, setbacks, et cetera, you wind up with a slower rate of economic growth going forward because of the increases in debt. And we keep ramping up the debt. We've increased debt by over $5 trillion in the last two years. That's going to have an impact on slower rates of economic growth. So if we were you know, just slightly above 2% trend growth you know, from the financial crisis to 2020, we're going to be below that going forward. So that 1.8, 1.9 is probably a fairly accurate number from the Fed. Right. Here's the unfortunate punchline of government stimulus. While we all like it, it boosts the economy when they're doing it. It has what's called a negative multiplier, meaning that in the long run, it actually takes away from economic growth. Mm -hmm. it, it's actually a net negative. So, you know, it's great. Every You know, the government spends money. They, we all get checks. We spend them boost the economy for a quarter, for three years, for two years, whatever it may be. And it's any kind of stimulus, not just checks to people, right. it, it's construction. But because the government's not productive in their debt, most of it, we end up in the long run paying for that debt. And well, that I, takes capital from the economy. Well, look, I, I think we have a really good example of this right now with this, with Hurricane Adalia. Um, so, right. you know, just hit Florida, lots of devastation. So we're gonna spend billions of dollars to rebuild, you know, after this hurricane. And so this is great, right? It's going to create short-term economic activity. We're going to see a boost in economic growth because of this spending, right? But here's what people miss is, is that all the money that people may have saved up or maybe, you know, wanting to spend on something in the future has now been pulled forward. So yes, they're going to get some money from FEMA and whatever to rebuild their house and do this, but now they're going to have to buy new appliances and new stuff and new clothes and things that they weren't going to buy now. So it's going to pull pull forward all that activity. But all the stuff that they were going to buy in the future has now been bought now, which is going to leave this void in the future. And this is where that negative growth rate comes from, because it pulled this pull forward of consumption. And this is the whole fallacy of the broken window. You know, if, if the broken win window uh, theory proved true, why don't we just blow up cities and rebuild them? Because that would just give us an you know, a, a infinite growth rate in the economy. <laughs> the reality is, is that that's not the case. And, and so we're going to see this in real time, this, you know, the, the part of using debt to rebuild things and, and create short term economic, economic activity, that debt has to be paid back by taxpayers, which takes more money from them to spend in the economy in the future. Quick break, we'll come back. We'll pick more up on what uh, Jerome Powell said and didn't say at summit uh, at the Jackson Hole Summit last week, and, and there's a lot more to get into, so don't go away. The Real Investment Advice blog. It's required reading for the informed investor. Catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell reports, Candid Coffee, and Lunch and Learn replays, plus each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show show or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com realinvestmentadvice.com 
Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset, your people. realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, realinvestmentadvice.com. <sighs> Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. When I have these meetings with parents, and I'm like, you can't afford to pay for your kid's school. You're going to be in the poorhouse. Well, it's my responsibility. No, it's not your responsibility to pay for your kid's school. Nobody ever said that. There is not a law on the books that says paying for your kid's college is your responsibility. The Real Investment Show podcast. Even in divorce, right? Your responsibility ends at 18. When they turn 18, they're done. The Real Investment Show podcast. Same show, your schedule. Life? is not easy. When you're living in the house and you're paying for everything for your kids, you're paying for their phone bill, you're paying, you know, you don't charge them rent, then you let them come home from college and live with you for a few years and you're still paying for everything. You're not teaching them any lessons. You're not te- you're not preparing them for what the real world is like. And this is the problem. We've created a whole generation of kids that we never prepare for life. At realinvestmentadvice.com. And now Another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Real Investment Show podcasts are now available from Stitcher Smart Radio at Stitcher.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click Ask a Question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell reports, plus each day's radio shows. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show, of course. Uh, lots of stuff going on. Earnings today kind of run a, uh, across the gambit of retail and tech. Uh, we have Academy Sports and Outdoors, Broadcom, Campbell's Soup, Dell, Computers, Dollar General, Lululemon, Mongo, New, uh, Nutanix, Polestar, UBS. So, uh, again, we got kind of a, a shot of a, you know some more additional uh, data on the status of the retail consumer. And, again, Target's kind of that... I'm sorry, not Target, um, Academy is kind of that lower end consumption side. So where, you know, a big chunk, you know, 80% of Americans go to shop um, type store versus, you know, uh, you know, higher end sporting goods store. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get a good pulse on the actual retail consumer. And again, this will also kind of come in at the same time that we're getting these personal spending and income numbers um, from consumers this morning as well at 730. And then, of course, on the you know, computer side, we're going to get, you know, more on, you know, data storage and computer sales and, you know, just how strong, you know, that that market really is. And again, this has been kind of a story of one or two companies at this point, you know, uh, you know, particularly in the AI space. But, you know, it, and it's interesting because if you take a look at the uh, number of mentions of AI versus metaverse. So remember just a couple of years ago, metaverse was all a thing. And, and you know, uh, Facebook went all in on the metaverse and had changed the name of their company to Meta and has been spending billions upon billions of dollars, you know, building out this meta and, and this metaverse. And they're losing billions of dollars every, every quarter on this expenditure into building this metaverse, yet with no real product to show for it just yet of, of, any, of any significance. But it was interesting that now, all of a sudden, the mentions of the metaverse 
are very small versus the mentions on AI. So now everybody has shifted their focus to the to AI versus the metaverse, particularly in earnings calls. And it just makes you go to wonder if all these billions that Meta has spent on the metaverse may be a lost cause. We'll, we'll find out, you know, kind of what happens. Things change fast. We'll see. Um, so back to the, the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell, uh, the summit conference last week, some interesting kind of, you know, comments across the board. You know, he mentions... You know that the economy has been doing better and, and the Fed is, is on track. Um, but when you talked about inflation, you know, I thought that was the most interesting aspect of his conversation. And I actually have a report coming on this out uh, uh, on this tomorrow as well, because he blamed the war in Ukraine for inflation. He says, well, you know, inflation has been, been a result of the, of the uh, war between Russia and Ukraine. Now, he didn't mention at all the trillions of dollars that were sent to households or the, tri- you know, the trillion plus dollars spent on quantitative easing or the massive amounts of bailouts that was, that was spent within the economy. He said, well, you know, the, the war... And, you know, created this supply-demand imbalance, and that's what created inflation. No mention of, of responsibility of the government or the Fed, you know, shutting down the economy and then sending checks to household, creating this massive imbalance between supply and demand. No, no. Now, you know, of course, you know, did he do this intentionally? Because he does serve at the pleasure of the president. So did he not want to point fingers at the administration? Did he not want to take responsibility for their own um you know, actions in creating inflation and their and their basically their inability to acknowledge that they created the inflation pressure. <laughs> I don't know. But I thought it was it was very obvious that, you know, he picked a very small issue to blame for the inflation. Mike, what was your takeaway? Well, I think what's really funny about that is the the Fed looks at inflation, they call it core inflation. So they exclude food and energy. Right. What the two biggest products from both Russia and Ukraine, from Russia, it's energy and from both countries, it's grains, it's food. It's really a lot of grains. So if the Fed was correct and they're looking at core CPI, it wouldn't be a problem. Right. Mm -hmm. It excludes all the stuff. Those two countries are major exporters of for the most part. Right. It's just ridiculous, Lance. I mean, it's you know, you know, we've talked about it. It's the arsonist trying to get the Nobel Prize for putting out the fire. <laughs> I mean, the, Powell and the Fed, along with the government, were clearly at fault. And then the Fed was clearly at fault for not raising rates much, raising rates much sooner than they did, for not stopping QE much sooner than they did. And you know, for really getting it wrong with the whole, their whole transitory call that inflation would last a few months, maybe a you know a quarter or two, and then go away, and that affects the mindset of the economy as well. So, clear, fault clearly lies with the government between the Fed and the you know Congress and the presidents, um, and, and you know this deflection is just a joke, in my opinion. Well, you know, it's just interesting because. You know, if you if you know you've shut down the economy and you know you're going to flood the system with liquidity, then you should know that inflation is more than transitory, right? It's that it's going to be right. here longer because you got to work that you know work the money. And we wrote articles about the sugar rush and you know the you know what was going to happen because of this. And it's just interesting that there's a a you know and again, is it intentional? Does he really you know? The, I I think the thing that scares me the most is does he really believe that it's Russia, Ukraine that caused the inflation and blaming it on them. Is that really what he believes? And and I guess more scary is, is that what the panel of Fed PhDs believe? Or is it inside the walls of the Fed? They go, look, we caused this, but we can't tell anybody that because then we look like idiots for doing this. <laughs> you know, so is that the real reason? I don't know. But it, it certainly seems that they would recognize that issue and policy would be more in line with, you know, kind of understanding that now we're on the other side of that massive monetary, in, you know, kind of input, those monetary inputs are now reversing. It's going to take time. You know, we've talked about the lag effect and that's been delayed because of this massive surge in M2, et cetera. But it seems like they would understand this 
and be saying, look, you know, we're probably done hiking rates here, but there's no way we can cut rates anytime soon because there's still too much money in the economy. And just be and just be open and transparent about it. And I think the markets would appreciate that better. Right. I agree. And they prided themselves one day on trying to be transparent. And now you can see they're clearly once again trying to mask uh, what's really going on. Um, it's kind of I think they're doing themselves a disservice mm -hmm. while it may serve their need today. I think it hurts them over time. And, you know, we'll see how this plays out. But inflation will come down back to two percent and Powell will be proven right. And he will be, you know, probably make the cover of time as the man that saved the world <laughs> yeah. again. Well, we, know. we've had Bernanke on the cover as uh, the man of the year. So I'm, I'm and sure Powell's not too far behind. Larry Summers and uh, Ruben. That, that's right. right. In, in, uh, for long term capital or I think it was long term capital. Right. Um, so. You know, the arsonists always seem to get the prize for putting out fires. And, you know, Lance, we just have to accept that that's what it is. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Well, um, you know, I just uh, this morning, um, again, you know, we've got a lot of stuff that's kind of coming out. And, and when we come back from the break, I, I want to kind of shift gears and talk a little bit about, you know, the the kind of forward outlook here as as, you know, particularly with the economy. And, you know, where we're going, because because, again, as we start to see this money moving out of the system, you know, a lot of these really kind of big divergences we have between, you know, retail sales and incomes and, and economic growth, there, there's going to have to be some kind of catch up here. And the question, you know, of course, now is that last year, nobody was expecting, a you know, everybody was expecting a recession last year. Sorry. This year now is we've gotten into the camp of the no landing scenario. But when we look at, you know, virtually most measures of things that have typically preceded recessions, they're all there, right? Um, you know, right. declining leading economic indicators, uh, inverted yield curves. Um, you know, I've got a chart in this weekend's newsletter that looks at the 10-year Treasury rate versus a proxy for the neutral rate. And that's in very restrictive territory, which has always preceded a recession going back to 1980. So, you know, there's just all this evidence that suggests that there's still the risk of a recession sitting out there. It's just taking a lot longer to mature. And, and this, and I think this goes back to, you know, Jerome Powell and, and his summit speech is that by misidentifying what caused inflation and what got us here, this is going to keep the Fed on the wrong side of the, 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 the fence, so to speak, until they're having to combat a recessionary impact because they broke something economically. And, and, and I think that's going to be what we're talking about next year or maybe you know, late next year or maybe even early 2025 is, hey, they broke something and now we're having to slash rates and you know, uh, do QE, whatever, to try to bail out that problem. <laughs> so, uh, and again, we'll talk about that because, you know, you know, this also feeds into what I was talking about in the opening segment about interest coverage for a lot of these companies. They don't have the ability to absorb higher interest rates when that refinancing wall hits starting next year. And I think that's going to be one of the things kind of driving the markets. But we're going to get into all of that with Michael Leibowitz right after the break. Dollar General uh, this morning, uh, missing earn earnings pretty badly. So again, this kind of goes back into this whole idea of, you know, is the retail consumer as strong as some of the economic data pretends? Because if you take a look at Dollar General's earnings this morning, I haven't had a chance to dig in really deep just yet. But if you take a look at their earnings versus what all this economic data says, oh, the consumer's doing fine. They got tons of money. Everybody's just spending like crazy. Dollar Generals, where a lot of these people shop. So we'll, we'll see. How about we'll talk about that. But we'll come back after the break with Michael Leibowitz. We'll get into interest coverage and the risk to small and mid cap companies because everybody keeps saying that that hey, got to buy small and mid cap because in an economic recovery, those are the guys that lead the charge. But is that really going to be the case? Come back, talk about it right after the break. Don't go away.
Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Oh, Red, I declare. I plum missed that candy coffee. Whatever am I gonna do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? Never. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn to special topic discussions and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA Advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. Get started right now at the website, realinvestmentadvice.com, or simply call our toll-free number, 855-RIA-PLAN at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. Yeah, on the break, uh, Dollar General missed on both earnings and revenue by a fairly decent miss. And Dollar General is now the 84 cent store because it's down 16% this morning uh, on that earnings announcement. And so uh, that's going to be a pretty sharp hit to the shares this morning. Uh, the, the stock was trading at $157 yesterday to 131.60 this morning. Now that may improve here once the market opens and people kind of just you know, digest what's going on with the earnings. But again, this is just kind of that, again, we keep getting this look at retail sales data, which has not really been great. Target, Budweiser, you know, Disney, a lot of these retail stocks and, and areas in consumer discretionary have not been really all that strong, which kind of under, kind of belies this underlying, you know, thought process that the economy is doing just fine and, and don't worry about it. So, again, uh, you know, it, it's just going to be a question of when reality kind of catches up with, with the data. But yeah, Lance, uh, go ahead. Lance, l let me uh, talk a little bit more about that, because this morning you were talking about the consumption numbers expected today that will come in, mm -hmm. expected to come in at plus 0.7 percent for the month. Right. But like you said, a lot of these uh, lower retailers are really struggling. It was Kohl's, Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. We're down substantially on uh, Dick's on sales estimates, sales earnings. Th there's really the consumer. Some consumers are really starting to struggle. There's a uh, there's a front page article in The Washington Post today about delinquencies on auto loans, on credit card debt. Basically, consumer loans is now the highest it's been since like 2012. Mm -hmm. We were higher now than we were before the pandemic. So I think everything that's happened over the last few years is finally catching up so consumers got basically dumped money got dumped on them and they didn't have anywhere to spend it so they saved it and they started spending it over time and overspending so that's why we had more growth than is typical and they basically ate through the savings and we also know that more debt was added credit card debt was added pretty significantly over that period too and it's all kind of coming to a head now, the combination of savings run out, higher debt levels in general, higher interest rates on that debt. Credit card debt must be over 20% right now. Mm -hmm. So if you're not making those payments in full, 
just trying to keep up with the interest expense on the credit card has got to be really difficult. So I, I, I think what we're seeing is the lower rung of consumers as far as income and wealth are starting to get hit. And my guess is that's just going to keep rising up through the through the ranks, so to speak, uh, as time progresses, as the savings get completely depleted. And as interest rates, you know, this is the lag effect as interest rate ca rates catch up. And, you know, this is under a almost perfect job environment. If if we start seeing some layoffs and th the news this week was a little concerning, it, it's just one week of new one month. I'm, you know, I'm not going to put too much into it. But, you know, seeing the number of job openings fall pretty rapidly is a sign is one sign and the quits rate. So the number of people quitting is back down to where it was t in 2019. That basically means that confidence of employees is pretty low, that that they don't feel comfortable quitting and trying to find a new job, mm -hmm. which is what they were doing. We had a very high quits rate. So the, the, I think the health of, con of the consumer is starting to falter. And that's two thirds. Of, that's the economy. That's right. two thirds of GDP. And the economy cannot withstand a bad, cons you know, poor consumption numbers. It's just too much of the economy. So, you know, we're going to get the number today. It may be strong. It may be weak. We're going to get retail sales in a couple of weeks. It, it may be this or that. But look at what these companies are telling you. Look at what these delinquency numbers are telling you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think you're starting to see two different stories between official economic data and kind of on the ground real data. Right. So, yeah, I, I think it'll be no, interesting. Yeah, no, and I think that's right. I mean, it, it, and again, you know, the one thing that, and I sent you an email yesterday that um, I'd gotten from Sally May, which right. was, you know, letting me know. So, my son has a Sally May loan for college, and they were letting me know that Sally May is not part of the federal student loan program. So, you know, those payments are, are going to restart October the 1st. And so, it's important. There's a lot of private student loan lenders out there that have been loaning money for student loans, and all those payments are about to start in uh, on October the first. And so it was just kind of a big scramble. Now everybody's realizing, was, "Oh crap, I got to start, you know, paying my student loan." But it was interesting. This email that I got from Sally May was like letting letting my son know is like, be aware. You know, you may be hearing all this other stuff in the media about student loan forgiveness and blah blah blah. You have a Sally May loan. We're not part of that. Your your payments restarting in <laughs> on October the first. So I just thought that was interesting that you know even the you know Sally May sending out emails to let people know this is coming. But that's just another impact, you know, to the consumer. And this and this really brings you know this brings us back around to what I what I wanted to talk about uh, uh, you know coming into this segment is you know there's a lot of people that are you know I keep seeing a lot of articles coming out it's like oh you need to buy you know forget the large cap stocks buy small and mid cap um, buy international buy emerging markets because you know they're cheap and they're going to play catch up but they've been big underperformers now for the last five years and since October small and mid cap have, have really done nothing at all I mean they're pretty much about the same level they were in October of, of the last year while there's been a huge surge in large cap stocks and you know part of you know, part of that concern and that you and I have had this concern, we've talked about this before, is this big debt wall that's coming up, this refinancing wall that's coming up next year. A lot of these term loans are coming due. In fact, there's a, a, a growing chunk of these term loans in 2024, 2025. A big chunk of those are coming due and are going to have to be refinanced. And so if interest rates are still high, that could be really problematic for a lot of these small and mid cap companies. Bankruptcies on a year-over-year -year basis in July, we're up 71%. Now, most of those are in companies you've never heard about, <laughs> but you right. know they're they're small and mid-cap companies. But small companies make up a a very significant portion of the employment in the country. They make up more than 50% of all the employment that comes from these small and mid-cap companies. It's not Apple and Google that's driving employment. It's all these small to mid-sized companies. It's the hairdresser on the corner. It's your local gas station. It's your local hardware store. Those are where a big chunk of employment comes from. Those are also the companies that have the least access to the credit markets. Those are also the companies that can't afford to do buybacks to help boost their share prices and make themselves look better. And they also don't have these massive war chests, you know, like Apple has 100, you know, 170 billion in cash or whatever sitting on their books. 
these small and mid-cap companies don't have that kind of liquidity. So there's potentially a significant risk in that small and mid-cap space next year. And this also might kind of explains why so many people are just hiding in these mega cap stocks, right? Because they're easy in, easy out, and there's no risk. about. You know, I buy Apple. They're not going bankrupt. Don't have to worry about it, right? It's what we call money good. Don't have to worry about Apple. I might have to worry about a dollar general, you know, in, in theory, right? Um, right? I just want to get your thoughts on that. Well, Apple, Look, let's look at like Apple. They played this really well. They borrowed a lot of money in 2020, 2021 when mm -hmm. rates were near zero, right? So they're flush with cash. So, and their debt is at very low rates. So their cash is earning five plus percent. Their debt is below 5%. So, you know, they're winning kind of on both sides of that. And that's, you know, for, for some companies that played it well, that's great. And, but that debt that they wrote in 2021 is probably three to five year debt. So a lot of it comes due starting 24, 25, 26. And like you said, there's a wall of debt, meaning that there's just a huge amount of debt that matures. And most companies, especially smaller and mid cap companies have to roll over that debt. They, they, they can't just let that debt mature and just live off the cash that they have or the profits that they make. So they're going to be replacing two, three, four percent debt with five, six, seven, eight percent debt. And that's really going to hurt. And a lot of them will probably try to get ahead of it and try to take action so that when they have to refinance, they've already dropped their expenses enough to kind of offset it. So even though that that wall of debt doesn't happen till starting next year and a year after, some of these smaller mid cap companies, even some large cap companies may start taking actions sooner to kind of protect against it yeah and look and you know and, and keep a watch on bankruptcies like i said you know bankruptcies are, are rising uh you know when you say they're up 71 percent from last year that sounds like wow man they're you know you're just you know kind of blowing the doors off bankruptcy filings but that's not really the case i mean if you had zero last year you know and you have one this year you know you're up 100 percent from last year so you know you got to be careful with that right so it sounds like not but the you know we are just starting to see this rise in bankruptcy filings and you know if we're going to get into a recession we're going to see those continue to rise and and you know the question is is a lot there's a lot of companies out there now uh, look I, I mentioned dollar general don't go run off and tell people i just said dollar general is going bankrupt i'm just picking on them this morning because they had <laughs> you know they had a bad earnings report but all i'm saying is that you have to be careful of that small and mid cap space because that interest service coverage and, and Mike, this may be a good scan for one of our five for Friday articles on Simplevisor is looking at companies with maybe high and low interest service coverage and you know, say these are the companies most at risk of potentially you know going out of business because of their inability to service their interest costs because they don't have the cash on the books. But, you know, this is this is going to be something that, you know, we're going to have to pay attention to as we head into next year. And, and again, this this goes back to why is everybody hiding in seven stocks? Because you don't have to worry about bankruptcy. Right. And for hedge fund managers and mutual funds, et cetera, I just got to I have to be invested. Right. I've got to have market performance, but I don't need the risk. So I just keep buying Apple and Microsoft and Nvidia and Tesla because they go up and I don't have to worry about bankruptcy, at least not yet. Who knows? Right, right. That that's the state of the market that we're in. It's yep. buy the seven and ignore the other four hundred ninety-three. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. All right, that wraps up the show for the day. Have a great Thursday, uh, Mike. Uh, sorry, uh, Richard Rosso, Danny Ratliff here in the morning to take care of you on Financial Fitness Friday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week.